Oi, gente, tudo bem? O convidado de hoje é Werner Herzog, um dos maiores cineastas de todos os tempos, que aceitou conversar com a gente sobre os livros que publicou ao longo da carreira. Ele dirigiu mais de 50 filmes, filmou nos cinco continentes do planeta, sendo um dos poucos cineastas do mundo a ter realizado esse feito. Dentre os filmes que dirigiu, destaco alguns deles. Fitz Carraldo, pelo qual ganhou a Palma de Ouro de Melhor Diretor no Festival de Cannes de 1982. Aguirre, A Cólera dos Deuses, que foi filmado no Peru e que contou com a participação de Rui Guerra, que é um dos nossos grandes cineastas ainda vivos. O Enigma de Caspar Hauser, Fata Morgana, Nosferato, O Vampiro da Noite, o Sobrevivente, que foi estrelado pelo Christian Bale numa das suas melhores performances, e O Vício Frenético, que é um filme estrelado por Nicolas Cage, também numa das suas melhores interpretações, e a grande Eva Mendes. Agora, gostaria de fazer uma pequena introdução dos livros que vão ser debatidos nessa conversa. O primeiro deles é Crepúsculo do Mundo, livro publicado pela Todavia aqui no Brasil, foi lançado esse ano, é um livro de ficção, escrito pelo próprio Herzog, e que remonta à experiência de Hiro Onoda, que foi um soldado japonês que ficou durante 30 anos em Lupang, que é uma ilha nas Filipinas, sem saber que a Segunda Guerra tinha acabado. Esse livro é uma grande joia, recomendo fortemente. O segundo livro foi Caminhando no Gelo, que foi publicado aqui no Brasil pela editora Paz e Terra, com a tradução da incrível Lúcia Najib, esse livro remonta à experiência do Herzog, escrita por ele mesmo, caminhando de Munique até Paris, ou seja, são mais de 700 quilômetros de caminhada, que o Herzog fez boa parte realmente caminhando, e aqui ele descreve essa experiência, que foi também uma tentativa de salvar a grande Lott Eisner, que foi uma das maiores críticas de cinema de todos os tempos, uma das fundadoras da Cinemateca Francesa, ao lado do incrível Henri Langlois. Então vale também muito a pena, é talvez a sua maior obra, inclusive considerada pelo próprio Herzog, o seu melhor livro. Seguindo adiante, a gente também falou do Conquista do Inútil, que foi publicado no Brasil pela Martins Pontes. É uma grande joia para quem quer estudar cinema, mas também para quem tem interesse em entender como é estar na Amazônia de fato. Esse livro foi, ele começou a ser escrito em junho de 1979, ele foi descrito em forma de diário, mas ele vai para muito além uh, das filmagens de Fitzcarraldo, é, que também é tema desse livro. Ele tenta descrever mais a paisagem, é, ele tenta demonstrar um pouco como é e como foram as relações com as pessoas durante esse período de filmagem. E, sobretudo, eu acho que o Herzog buscou nesse livro a matéria do sonho, que eu acho que permeia toda a obra do cineasta e, portanto, é uma grande joia, porque vai para além de uma mera descrição do que é fazer um filme. Ele vai também na tentativa de observar a Amazônia, apreender o que há de real ali, que toca na própria pele dele durante as filmagens do incrível filme Fitzcarraldo. Ah, antes que eu me esqueça, eu gostaria de agradecer imensamente os quatro atores que foram convidados para fazer pequenas intervenções lendo trechos dos três livros que eu acabei de apresentar. São eles, Eloísa Yamashita, Ricardo Lopes, Cláudia Ventura e Alexandre Dantas. Fizeram leituras lindas que vão aparecer aqui durante a conversa com o Herzog e eu tenho certeza que ele vai ficar muito feliz com esse presente. É uma honra também imensa é, contar com a participação desses queridos amigos que enriqueceram imensamente esse episódio. Então, meu muito obrigado. É, enfim, chegou a hora, não é mesmo? O Herzog está aqui na minha frente esse tempo todo esperando a gente começar a entrevista. Hi, Mr. Herzog, thank you very much for talking to me today. It's a great honor. Uh, and uh, my first question. I would like to start by the twilight, the, the twilight world, the crepúsculo yeah. do mundo. And first of all, I would like to ask you, how did you meet Onoda and how were those encounters with him? Uh, well, you don't ask me, uh, just read the first half page. I'm describing my encounter with Onoda. And of course you are pointing at an embarrassing moment where 
the um, office of the emperor had stretched out feelers, whether I uh, uh, would feel all right to meet the emperor in a private audience. And I had the feeling, for God's sake, this will be all formalities and um, no real conversation. And I said, no, but you cannot do that in Japan. It's a faux pas. It's a cultural faux pas uh, uh, so bad that I still feel embarrassed. And I said, somebody asked her, whom else would you like to meet? And I said, Onoda. And um, so that's how I met him. And we met several times and had some very good conversations. And, and what were the characteristics meeting him that were impressive to you? Like uh, his attitude, his, uh, his behavior towards life? Well, the personality, you could see uh, from 100 meters away that there was a man of great dignity, uh, a very stoic man, a very human, human being. And I do, I do think it's very, very impressive to me uh, how, 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 how honorable he was towards his uh, feelings uh, towards the reality he was in and also to Japan. And therefore I would like to ask you too about how, uh, what was impressive to you uh, regarding Japan because you were also directing operas then and did, did some elements of the couch also impress you as a, in a general way? Uh, that's a big question. Um, I think uh, Onoda is quintessential Japanese, but not in the military sense. It's something a deep culture uh, of uh, the honor of the samurai in him. He never appeared very much like a, like a military person. He was a very human person um, and never would uh, follow um, an order blindly. Uh, and he was set, uh, he was left alone and, and he knew and he was told, you have to make your own rules. Do not wait for anyone to tell you what to do. You have to assess the situation. And uh, his assessment of the situation was correct, correct, correct in every single detail. But in the combination itself, it gave the wrong impression that the war was still on. And when you have hundreds and hundreds of planes fly, war planes flying over you west, it's a signal for, for you or for him that the war is on, but that was a Korean war already. And then a few years later, eight, nine years, uh, B-52 bombers, battleships, aircraft carriers back, passing by just from the Bay of Manila. And um, his, um, his observations were completely correct, but uh, it's almost like a tragic, um, a tragic misunderstanding that uh, um, led him to uh, to wage a fictitious war. The war was fictitious, and that's so unusual about him. Agora a gente vai ficar com a primeira intervenção do programa feita pela atriz Eloísa Yamashita, que leu alguns trechos do Crepúsculo do Mundo. Despistamento, astúcia, mimetismo, todos eles. Elementos honrados ou não que Onoda quer aprender com a natureza. Subordinados apenas e tão somente à condução da guerra e ao objetivo da sua luta. Em vez do ataque frontal portando uma bandeira, ele quer se fazer invisível. Tornar-se um sonho inatingível, um vapor que se dissipa, prende de perigos, um rumor. Quer fazer da floresta mais do que floresta. Uma paisagem com aura do perigo, da morte à espreita. O Noda Estimada detém pela última vez seu caminhão junto do Hospital Provisório de Campanha. O desespero ali permanece imutável. O homem ferido a quem o Noda dera a granada de mão para detonar a munição encontra-se quase inconsciente. Das camas, os olhares o acompanham calados. O Noda manobra o caminhão junto do hospital. Ele, estimada, apoiam nos ombros pesadas mochilas e apoiam seus fuzis. 
Presa ao cinto de Onoda, uma espada de samurai, propriedade da família desde o século 17. Até o momento, sempre acomodou com cuidado todos os refúgios pelos quais passou. Os dois soldados batem continência para os feridos e desaparecem em silêncio na floresta pelos montes que ali principiam. And also in the book, it's very interesting the description of the forest itself and the role the forest has in this journey of Onoda. Yeah. Yes, we, we had a we had an instant understanding over over the jungle because he had uh, been in the jungle for 30 years. And I have had experiences in the jungle and and of course then it's easy to connect. And also did uh what what is the why do you think the forest has this feeling in which you lose your senses? Also the the, the strong the strength of the forest, not no, you don't lose your senses. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Let's say the, the La Selva Virgen, the uh, the, the uh, jungle, uh, is just another forest. But when you take it as an inner landscape, and in my films, for example, and in my book, the jungle is not uh, just a technical term. It is an inner landscape. It's a place of fever dreams. Yeah, and you and you can, in fact, there's also the interesting metaphor of the boat of Fitzcarraldo, in a sense. And I think that you, and that's very interesting in Onoda too, in some sense, that he saw in the forest uh, this beauty, this divine beauty, in some sense. And I would like very much also to, for you to comment because of walking in ice, for example. I have the feeling while you're walking from Munich to Paris. Uh, you find some kind of element that is beyond, something that is not completely, you find some beauty while you're walking. Uh, is that correct? I think that's also a very important point on your book. Sure, yes, but uh, uh, I cannot read Onoda's mind. I, ca I cannot uh, place myself into his soul. Uh, for him, probably the... Uh, the jungle was more the place where he was protected, he could hide, but he wouldn't hide all the time. He would step out and uh, fire a few shots um, of ammunition over the heads of startled villagers. So, and, and he would retreat into the jungle and he would leave no traces. So um, in, in that respect, I think the jungle was different for him. It was and, a basis of operation. Yeah, and also a very practical uh, survival way. He, he, he needed to survive, right? Yes. And, and do, you, do you, I would like also you, if you could talk a little bit about Miss Eisner, because she was a very important person, not just for German film uh, culture, but also to the world culture. And it would be also very nice if you could say uh, some words about her. And I know in the book, there's in the final part, a very important uh, speech you gave about her. But I, I described her in a, in a short speech that I held uh, when she received an invitation to return to Germany and receive an award. And well, to make it short, she was Jewish and very far left. And immediately uh, a, um, a thorn in the flesh of the Nazis, of the fascists, and she was under threat and fled Germany the very day Hitler took power, on that very day. And she survived in hiding in France and became very important through her writings about film and about literature. And she became some sort of a mentor for me. And when she was dying, suddenly she had a massive stroke. A friend called me and said, please come quickly, take a plane, come, Lotte is dying. And after um, a few minutes of looking into flight schedules and train schedules, I decided, no, I will walk. I will come walking. I will not allow her to die because I'm 
coming walking like a pilgrimage or like a deep protest. Um, she did not know that I was coming, but when I arrived, she was out of hospital. And you know, I'm not, I'm not superstitious, uh, but uh, it, it, was, uh, it was wonderful that she had survived. Yes, and, and I also, that's an interesting point, uh, because although you, you don't go into a, a superstition point in the book, I find it also that you go deep on, on, on into some uh, div divinity, like I already said. So what is the role, for example, in the religion or the sense of, of seeing those divinity through your walk, during your walk? Uh, you should be careful. Uh... I don't feel comfortable when you speak about divinity. Walking is just the act of walking and it's hard. It's hard to walk uh, almost a thousand kilometers in the beginning winter and snowstorms against you and so. But um, I, I understand, yes, there's something, something deeper than the description of a voyage. Um, and you see it in my films and you see it almost everywhere um some quest for something transcendent and probably that's the strength of the book the language itself and uh, and in the a, a deeper a deeper stratum in it and um this is why i always said uh, watch out uh, this book and other things i've written probably will have a longer life than my films. But I've been wrong too many times when I try to, to make a judgment about my own things. But I think what you're correct about is that this book is also uh, bringing us closer to the walking process. And I think this is bringing closer to, to your philosophy towards film and towards arts. And I think that's a, a great thing of your book on this sense of, the, of walking on ice specifically. Yeah. Uh, and I think, and, and that's, I would like also, there are some elements when you describe, for example, there's a bridge in Vienna that was falling in the seventies. I think yeah. it was Heiss Kuka, right? If I'm not speaking yeah. wrong. Yeah, probably, yeah. And, and, and also you're talking about Haile Salassie and some other important uh, figures in history. And, and but those are, those are just, uh, just fleeting images and dreams while walking, daydreaming. That Haile Selassie is named has nothing uh, political or historical in it and that a bridge uh, collapses and slowly, I say slowly, like an old man going to sleep, lying down for sleep. So uh, uh, it's it's just uh, it's just inner inner images, inner landscapes. And also, how was it to write during the walk? Because there's a lot. There was a lot of rain, for example, in many cases. And I, this is a very interesting point for me. How did how was this experience of writing it while in cold and, and wet? Well, I had a, a small notebook that would fit in my shirt pocket. And I would, when it was raining, I would, for example, um, take refuge in, a, in an ab abandoned bus station where there was just a bench and a little roof. Or I would um, sleep uh, in the hay of a barn and right there or I would uh, uh, go under a bridge and right there, and then since it became dark, I would sleep under the bridge. Depois dessa discussão interessantíssima, a gente vai ficar agora com a intervenção de Ricardo Lopes, que lê um trecho do Caminhando no Gelo. No minuto, a estrada ficou soterrada na neve. Debaixo da tempestade, um trator com os faróis acesos atolou em pleno campo. O camponês já desistiu de tirá-lo dali e está parado junto dele, perplexo. Nós dois, os fantasmas, não nos cumprimentamos. Ai, que caminho difícil! 
e esse vento que me atira a neve ardente em pleno rosto, bem na horizontal. Ainda por cima, sempre subidas. Mas mesmo na descida, tudo dói. Estou voando em esquis. Meu corpo inclinado para a frente paira sobre a tempestade. Os espectadores são uma floresta imóvel, como uma estátua de sal. A floresta está boquiaberta. Vou, vou sem parar. As árvores gritam. Mas por que ele não para? Penso, é melhor continuar voando, para que ninguém perceba que minhas pernas estão machucadas e enrijecidas. Vão se esboroar como gesso na aterrissagem. Não deixar transparecer, seguir voando. Vi um vinhateiro, anão, de trator. Depois, meu menino auscultou meu peito para ver se o coração ainda batia. O relógio que lhe dei também está andando, diz ele. Faz tic-tac. Eu sempre quis ter, por causa da paisagem, um postal da barragem que se rompeu perto de Frejos. Em Viena, a ponte sobre o Danúbio, que desmoronou, foi se deitando lentamente na alvorada como um velho ao adormecer. Segundo uma testemunha que ia atravessá-la naquele instante, milharais ao redor, antes de tudo, um convite à reflexão. So I will go I will go also to the conquest of the useless and talk a, yeah. a little bit about it. Uh, yeah. I would also like you to to discuss uh, the importance because you've met important Brazilian filmmakers. Uh, like Glauber Rocha, like Rui Guerra, and Carlos Diegues, and how important were they for you? And, and... They, they were very helpful because uh, when you're as a filmmaker in a foreign country, I would always seek uh, uh, not um, contact with the bureaucracy I would seek the contact with filmmakers. What advice do you have here? Um, do you know a great actor for this little part? Um, where should I have my, at that time, a celluloid? Where should I have my film um, put in a laboratory? So very practical and, and very, of course, uh, always a deep respect uh, and friendship. Rui Guerra, Glaube Rocha. Uh, uh, I can only say I, I admire their film and, and I like, I always like them as persons and deep respect for what they have created. So it's a natural thing. My advice for young filmmakers, if you film in a foreign country, uh, don't go to the bureaucracy Go to, the, go to the filmmakers there. Agora que a gente falou sobre Glauber Rocha, Cacá Diegues, o Rui Guerra, a gente vai ficar com a intervenção de Alexandre Dantas, que lê um trecho de Conquista do Inútil. Bem cedo pela manhã, os aleijados tomam banho de mar. Depois, as empregadas jovens e babás de branco levam os bebês dos ricos para passear. Os carrinhos se aglomeram, onde as empregadas dos bebês se encontram para bater papo. Gisela Stort chegou e nós logo fomos para o estoque de figurinos. Experiência totalmente frustrante. À noite, até tarde, na casa de Carlos Diegues, não conseguimos cruzar com Glauber Rocha. E Rui Guerra parece que está em São Paulo. Fiquei sabendo que Armando ainda mora na mesma casa, cujas paredes estão a um palmo do traçado do novo metrô. Todas as outras casas em volta foram demolidas e ele está se matando de tanto beber. Na praia, meninos empinam pequenas pipas, as quais eles fazem voar, passando pelas calçadas e pela rua e entre os prédios. Uma delas foi baixando e se enroscou em uma Kombi, que puxou a linha de nylon até rasgar. A pipa ficou presa no para-choque dianteiro e foi parar embaixo do carro, de onde tentou sair violentamente. Debatia-se tão forte de um lado para o outro, embaixo do carro, que ele parou em pleno fluxo do trânsito e os passageiros tiveram de cortar a linha. E que advice would you give, por exemplo, if you want to shoot in the forest? If you 
let's say oh, oh there's to... no advice there's no advice just uh, <laughs> just do it it's uh, uh, you have to you have to understand where you are and um, you have to do the right thing there's nothing dangerous about the jungle it's just another forest but um, uh, it it's good to understand uh, the rainforest, the jungle, um, in its essence. You see, not not just a configuration of trees and green and lianas. Dando continuidade à discussão sobre o conquista do inútil, a gente vai ter agora uma intervenção de Cláudia Ventura, que também lê trechos de Conquista do Inútil. Na pequena Bahia, à minha frente, formou-se uma forte contracorrente. Com os pedaços de madeira, vem agora cada vez mais espuma branca. Várias árvores gigantes, enganchadas umas nas outras, passam por mim como se fossem uma ilha rotatória, rolar de pesadas pedras no fundo do rio. Alguém já ouviu pedras suspirarem? And, and also, I would like to mention, because I think this is a very important work of yours, uh, there's a manifest that you wrote, uh, and you were also presenting with Roger Ebert in an occasion, and it's talking about the ecstatic truth. And I would like, it would be very nice to comment, uh, if you could, about how important is this manifest also today? How is the importance of ecstatic truth in pictures? Uh... It's not there only in, in cinema, it's there in, in writing as well. But um, we would need 48 hours to, uh, to have a deeper understanding. I make it very short. And I, I quote two, uh, two witnesses for me, two, two allies. One is a French writer, André Gide, who famously said, I change facts to such a degree that they resemble truth more than reality. That's a very, very beautiful idea. And the other witness of mine would be, and I always quote him, Michelangelo, the, um, um, when you look at his uh, sculpture of the Pietà, when you look in the face of Jesus, um, it's a tormented face of a 33-year-old man. And when you look into the face of his mother, his mother, the mother of a 33-year-old man, is only 15 years old. So, and meaning uh, the same thing, he, uh, he changes realities so that we see the deeper essence of both figures. And it doesn't give us fake news. It does not lie to us. It's something much, much deeper and much more important. So that's in, in essence what, uh, uh, what I would describe as ecstatic, ex the ecstasy of truth. And that's poetry as well, like you said. And, and, and you I have it you're... in poetry, you have it in sculpture, you have it in movies. Uh, um, it's very a, a very deep concept, but today everybody is obsessed with uh, fake news. Yes, we have to, because uh, the intent is always an important thing. And uh, secondly, there is too much emphasis on on facts. Facts per se um, are, un, are uninteresting. They are important because they create norms. Um, so because of that, we have to take them seriously. Uh, but they, uh, you cannot say you cannot you cannot say facts are equal to truth. No, they are not. And for that, I uh, my witness is a phone directory of Manhattan of. Rio de Janeiro, you have 4 million entries, 4 million entries, every single one correct. 
everything in one factually correct, but it doesn't tell you anything about Rio. It doesn't tell you anything about the feeling of the people. It doesn't tell you anything about the joy. It doesn't tell you anything about uh, the joy of Garincha, who is in the phone book or was in the phone book. So facts do not constitute truth. And the role of perception in that is, is essential. Yes. Let's, let's not go into philosophy. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's stick, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> let's, stick, let's stick with Michelangelo and Garincha in, in his entry in the phone book. O livro Conquista do Inútil ainda é tema da nossa discussão e agora a gente vai ter a segunda leitura de Cláudia Ventura. O acampamento está em completo silêncio, feito morto. Nenhum movimento, nenhum ruído, nenhum pássaro na floresta. Coisa alguma. Apenas a chuva, que não para. A floresta mantém-se fervorosamente calada. Olhar o rio é como olhar um fogo flamejante. Não conseguimos tirar os olhos. Ininterruptamente chegam ilhas inteiras de galhos podres e madeira podre, carregadas pela correnteza, com tudo o que apodrece no chão da floresta. Em torno das frondosas árvores arrancadas, formam-se entrelaçados de galhos velhos e de tudo o que se decompõe no chão da mata. Passam boiando pedaços de madeira e sujeira que não se separam. Navegar no rio com um barco a motor, ou decolar, ou pousar na água com um hidroavião, seria impossível, por tudo que a correnteza levava. O nível do rio vai lambendo para o alto, cada vez mais para perto de mim. Da vegetação à margem, lá fora, apenas a ponta mais alta de seus galhos estão fora da água e arvoram-se, combatendo a correnteza. As bananeiras mais altas já estão debaixo de água. Yeah, and I would like then to go back to, to the concrete part of, of the twilight world, okay? Normally you write very fast, normally. Also your scripts, you, you, I've heard you many yeah. times saying that you write them very fast. And how long was it right to, to write Twilight World and how was this process? Did you uh, uh, made it also very fast and then you read it again and you reshaped it? No, no. no the, the, the text was in me. Um, and I could have written it 15 years ago, or I could have written it eight years ago, um, because, and there are many things that are completed in me, and I see a whole film uh, as if you were sitting in the cin cinema already, and I just need to copy. Um, so, uh, be because of that, it goes fast. I do not have any... Uh, plans of story outline and whatever. I just sit down and write what is already fully articulated in me. And did you, for for writing this book specifically, did you go to talk with people who were with you that win no. it, witnessed? No. No. But uh, Onoda himself had uh, written a memoir, which is called no surrender, no surrender. Not, not that interesting, um, but, but it's okay. But I, I looked into it sometimes for verifying dates or locations. So I, I did not want to be completely wrong. And I've never been in Lubang Island in the Philippines. It's a Lubang Island of my fantasies. And... Uh... Also, you, for example, you you mentioned in, in of walking in ice, for example. Uh, I, just a small doubt ahead. Is Faraki that you mentioned the filmmaker Faraki that I wanted always to ask you? Uh, and there's Artne Bush also. Artne Bush is also yeah. a filmmaker, right? Yes, yes, so, correct. Uh, and with Faraki, I had no, I had no uh, dealings or no knowledge of him at all. So it's completely irrelevant. It's just like in a um, uh, when walking, all of a sudden a name comes across, floats by. Um, 
and um, and I, I describe it. It doesn't have any any deeper meaning. Uh, I have no idea what Farocchi made. Um, so completely irrelevant. But it's it, it's only like um, you you walk uh, you come at a river and and there are, there are leaves and and branches floating by. Yeah, and and I think it's also very very important the role of animals, uh, and I compare it in the case of walking on ice. It reminded me and touched me because of the peregrine, and in the peregrine there's such a deep, and I compare it to your book such a deep poetry on observing, observing the animals, observing trees, uh, and I think that's. That, that's also an important remark that would be nice to hear from you. Yeah, it's a, the depth of passion uh, of the peregrine. And it's a very limited worldview, a very tiny segment. It's only peregrine falcons, so that's it. Um, no description of human beings, nothing. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, it, it is one of the great books of our times. It used to be completely obscure. And uh, I have advised every uh, young filmmaker read this, or any young writer besides the prose, the caliber of language is, is extraordinary. We haven't seen anything like this since since Joseph Conrad. Yeah, and, and I think it's true in, in, in the sense that you arrive. I think also in, uh, that sometimes we lose too much time overanalyzing things. And sometimes it's better if you leave out what you can, right? Yeah. If you have the chance to leave the stuff uh, and then talk about them. Yeah. And we well, are I going. So good. It's also good now since I have two books out. It's you have only the first one in uh, in ten days uh, in Germany. There will be my book, Every Man for Himself and God Against All. It's much uh, bigger. It's three hundred fifty pages, uh, some sort of memoirs. It's not an autobiography, but some sort of memoirs and mostly memoirs of ideas. What is the origin of films? What is the origin of certain ideas? So in, in that respect, it's unusual. And, it, uh, and all of a sudden uh, in Germany or here in the United States, people start to discover that, uh, that I'm a writer as well. Yeah, and that's also why I invited you. It's nothing new because of Walking in Ice was published in the mid 70s. That was published before your parents even met. Yeah, uh, before I could even <laughs> exist. Uh, we are going almost to the end. We are almost getting to the end of the conversation. Yeah. I would like to make you just some more questions. Going back to the, to the book. Uh, there's a, in the end, I think it's one of the most beautiful parts in the end, uh, where you speak about uh, time, you speak about, you make a reflection about the present, the past, the future. And it's a very important image, I think. The one that you show that Onoda, he was usually had the habitude to walk to his back in order not to give the, the, the steps to the enemy. He would go on the direction. Oh, yeah, he would walk his, backwards. Yes, walk backwards. And that his footprints would point in the wrong direction. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think this is an incredible picture and image, uh, and and also because of time. And I think it's very beautiful when you say uh, that even though he's walking with his backwards, okay, time is going still to the future. And so, uh, you know, this, this doesn't change the way of time, but the time itself is all the time connected to a, a perception. Yeah. yeah, this, what you are mentioning uh, uh, was one of the reasons why I did not want to make a film. Uh, because um, um, 
thinking about time is something that's not a movie. Or for example, at the very end, uh, language starts to disintegrate, language starts to dissolve. There are only fragments of, uh, of, of, of sentences, fragments of, of images that have nothing to do with Onoda. Uh, and it's, uh, that's, that's uh, something which is only literature and, and that makes the quality of the book. I think. Depois dessa fala incrível do Herzog, a gente vai ter a segunda leitura de Crepúsculo do Mundo feita por Eloísa Yamashita. Começa então uma coisa que é como se, por acaso, sem despertar atenção, um acompanhante permanente se juntasse a esse quadro. Um irmão natural do sonho, dotado das certezas do sonho. Um tempo informe de sonambulismo. Embora em seu presente tudo seja real, imediato, palpável, sinistro, impreterível. A selva, o lamaçal, as sanguessugas, os mosquitos, a gritaria dos pássaros, a sede, a coceira na pele. Mas o sonho tem o seu próprio tempo. Um tempo que se desenrola toda velocidade para frente, para trás, estanca, para, prende a respiração, salta subitamente como um animal selvagem que, desprevenido, toma um susto. Uma ave noturna canta e todo um ano se passou. Uma gota d'água sobre a folha séria de uma bananeira apanha por um instante um raio de sol e outro ano se foi. Uma trilha de milhões e milhões de formigas vindas do nada ao longo da noite avança entre as árvores sem que possa jamais encontrar a sua origem ou seu fim. O cortejo marcha imperturbável por vários dias e desaparece tão abrupta e enigmaticamente como surgiu. E de novo, um ano inteiro se passou. Depois, uma única e mesma noite de vigília, sob a pressão enorme de um poder hostil que armou emboscadas por toda parte que nunca chega ao fim. Somente as luzes súbitas de projéteis traçantes e o dia que se recusa a amanhecer, mesmo quando se pode acompanhar o ponteiro do relógio e ver todo o céu noturno girando em torno da estrela polar, o dia não vem, não vem e não vem. O tempo, fora da nossa vida, Parece possuir a qualidade dos ataques abruptos, sem a capacidade de sacudir o universo da sua indiferença. A guerra de Onoda é insignificante para o universo, para o destino dos povos, para o curso da guerra em si. Ela se compõe da união de um nada imaginário e um sonho. Mas essa sua guerra, produzida por nada, é um acontecimento arrebatador arrancado da eternidade. Sim, yeah, há so many layers on it. And yeah. there's always something behind, some poetry on it. And yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a poetry. It's a poetry that uh, uh, mm. that you can that you can find there, and it's something different than in my than my films. Yes, completely. And and also the, I I wanted to ask you what is the importance of being isolated, to isolate sometimes yourself from the group, from the mass, from the ongoing roots of life, to sometimes stick to yourself, to your own self, I would say. Well, I would say that uh, in Onoda's case, solitude uh, was something very profound, the lone soldier. <laughs> Uh, uh, and when you are a filmmaker, yes, you are surrounded by collaborators and actors and whatever, but very deep inside, it's a very solitary, a very solitary profession. And writing a book is a very solitary profession. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong about it. Yes. I am and... very much among people as well, and I enjoy... I enjoy the presence of others, but um, deep inside, I think um, writers and filmmakers and probably artists are, are uh, naturally uh, creatures who have to understand solitude. And do you think there's a difference between writing literature for a book or writing a film, thinking of writing a script? For you, is there any difference on your process? in the process now, uh, but um, when I write a screenplay, I see a whole film. 
I, it's like me sitting in a theater and I see the entire film so I can quickly describe what are they doing, what are they saying, what is the music, what, what are we, what are the locations. So um, it's, it's more when I, it's, it's more the work of somebody who copies. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and also in this sense, were there any writers writing in the twilight world, for example, or the conquest of the useless, in, the, in this case was more a diary, but when you're writing, is there any influence of writers or your favorite writers are counting on it or no? You don't think about any of them. I, I wouldn't see it directly, but of course, uh, I'm Im embedded in reading. When you look behind me, there are books. <laughs> uh, I like to read and the entire sum of reading uh, probably creates a sense, a deeper sense for poetry, a deeper sense. No, a sense for poetry was always there. Even when I was a child, I had this sensation there was, um, some poetry in the place, a mythical poetry, the place where I come from. And it's a, it's a waterfall in a ravine behind the farmhouse where I grew up in the mountains. So I, I immediately understood that there was something deeper than just a landscape. There was a landscape embedded in poetry. Yeah. Yeah, and... and and also going back to Miss Eisner and, and also to her importance, also from her writing. In this sense, he wrote, she, she wrote also about Murnau and, and about Lang. And were those writings or the movies of Murnau, for, for example, important to you? Uh, no, to your... no, because I, uh, I have never read uh, a book on filmmaking, not one, with one exception, and that was Lotte Eisner's the haunted screen, the demonic screen, as she as a German original is, but um, it didn't influence my uh, my work. In a way, uh, she made me see uh, Murnau's Nosferatu, and it's the only film of Murnau that I ever saw, and I had the feeling this was very very important. Um, Germany had great cinema before it lapsed into the culture of barbarism under the Nazis. So for her to build a bridge was important. And uh, I think uh, when you are a painter, for example, it's good that you feel yourself within a tradition, a deep cultural tradition. Um, as filmmakers the same, but our tradition was interrupted through the barbarism and there was there were no fathers, only grandfathers. And because of that Murnau, or this one film by Murnau was important. Important since I made my version of Murnau's Nosferatu, like an homage to Murnau, I felt on solid ground all of a sudden, connected. Yes, yes, and also it's very deep touching in Nosferatu that you're touching the evil, showing evil in some sense. You're showing, and that is a, a beautiful thing on your movie. Uh, so finally, my last question, okay? Uh, maybe, maybe you have said it already many times, <laughs> but it would be nice if you could comment on your feelings on Brazil and especially, I know you're a big fan of Garrincha, that you're yeah. a big fan of football. And uh, how important is Brazil in your mind? Also, not just Rio, but of course, having filmed in the Amazon, there's an important role on you, but that would be very nice for our Brazilian audience to know. I can say it very short. Part of my soul lives in Brazil and in the jungle. Yes. Okay. That's that's perfect. So thank you, Mr. Herzog. Uh, yes. When your new book is released, I hope we can do well, another talking. Okay. 
Uh, it, it is in translation at the moment into Portuguese and Spanish and English. So uh, the book, the new book, the very new book will, uh, will be published in 10 days from now in its German original. But until you see it in a bookstore in Brazil or in the uh, United States or in India or wherever, uh, it will take uh, until next year. Okay. That's that's yeah, and I will keep looking at it. And when there's the release of this yeah. book, I, I will would be delighted yeah. to to make a new talk about him. And I also would like to remind you, it's not only that I have um, last year I finished two books, but I also finished two new films, ah. and they are also being released now. Ah, good. In these days, in in two weeks, uh, my last film will be shown in. Toronto and Telluride and the film before was shown for the first time in June in the United Kingdom so it's just an avalanche of new things that I that I have to uh, release. And which are the movies, the names? Uh, one is uh, The Fire Within. It is a musical and it's uh, it has a secondary title Requiem for Katya and Maurice Croft. Katya, you spell with an I, Katya, and Maurice and Croft with a double F at the end. K-R-A-F-T-T, Croft. Oh, no, K-R-F-F-T, Croft. There were two volcanologists who perished in an explosion in Japan. And the other is called Theater of Thought. And it will be released uh, in two weeks from now. That's good news. I'm, I'm, I'm hope, I hope to see it very soon, <laughs> as soon as possible. All right. And thank you. And we, we see thank each you, other yeah. in the future, maybe. Thank you yeah. very much. All right, good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bom. Chegamos ao fim do episódio. Muito obrigada a você que assistiu tudo até aqui. Se você gostou, curte, compartilha, se inscreve no canal. Além disso, você também pode seguir a gente no Instagram, arroba Filme Falado. E você também pode me seguir no meu perfil pessoal, arroba Pedro.nmartim. Desejo meus parabéns ao Herzog, que completa 80 anos agora no início de setembro. Desejo sucesso aos novos filmes e também ao novo livro. Agradeço também, como de costume, Fábio Gatti, que fez a logo desse programa, a Isabela Morricone, que fez a animação de abertura e encerramento, e também Roberta Braz, que sabe da importância que tem para esse programa, é uma das produtoras. Eu agradeço também imensamente tudo que ela tem feito para que isso dê certo. E, ah, também é importante lembrar os quatro atores que fizeram as leituras do episódio de hoje. Eloísa Yamashita, Cláudia Ventura, Alexandre Dantas e Ricardo Lopes. Muito obrigado, meus queridos. A leitura de vocês enriqueceu imensamente o episódio. Eu tenho certeza que o Herzog vai adorar receber esse presente. Valeu, gente. Até sexta que vem.